Melanie is, uh, is the author of a very popular book on the latest in string theory and M theory, and in particular, she's an expert on supersymmetric flux backgrounds and complexifications of string and M theory. So, I really look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much. And hi, everybody. So, my goal is to um, continue Catherine's lectures, as Igor was saying. And I wrote down the plan of uh, what I would like to um, discuss in the next two lectures. So, Katrin was discussing uh, some elements that we need um, for flux compactification. So, she introduced you um, to the supersymmetric theories, to the um, supersymmetric theories, uh, low energy effective actions of supersymmetric theories. She discussed about compactification. Um, she showed you how, well, she introduced the concept of moduli fields and briefly touched at the end how um, the moduli space problem can be solved if you introduce fluxes instead of taking conventional Calabi-Yau compactifications. So what I would like to do um, today is to take it from there and tell you much more about flux compactifications. In con concretely, I would like to talk about flux compactifications of the type 2B theory. The reason I would like to talk about the type 2B theory is because many of the applications, like the clever strassler model and many other applications also in cosmology, um, have been done, have been mostly worked out in the, con in the context of type 2B. So let me, um, so let me um, walk you in this lecture through the GKP analysis, Giddings Katripolchinsk analysis of type 2B theory with fluxes. I will show you um, that there is a powerful no go theorem that uh, was in the literature for many years. In fact, since the 1980s, when people were uh, looking just at perturbative string theory, they were looking at compact internal manifolds. They didn't know about brains, sources, or anything like that. Then they concluded that if you would like to have a warped compactification of type 2B string theory, then it's not possible to get fluxes if you compactify to Minkowski space. And the sitter space was not allowed at all by the equations of motion. We will later on see that um, we will later on see that if you introduce brain sources, how this no-go theorem can be evaded, and uh, the no-go theorem can be evaded either by brain sources or non-perturbative effects, an effect that uh, KKLT, Kalos, uh, Kacho, Linde, and Trivedi used in order to get the sitter space, and we will discuss this tomorrow. So let me start um, by giving you some more um, motivation of why a string theorist is interested precisely in n equal to 1, d equal to 4. So why do we want to have n equal to 1 in d equal to 4 as a string theorist? Well, string theorists are interested in n equal to 1, d equal to 4 for precisely the same reasons as phenomenologists are interested in it. So let me call this the... Um, the um, bottom-down approach, a uh, bottom-up approach. Well, there are many nice things um, that you can solve if you do have supersymmetry, and I'm sure many, um, Nima may have told you many of these motivations or the other lectures. So you can solve um, supersymmetry provides a solution to a hierarchy problem. And Nati mentioned it already today. So why the Higgs mass is so much smaller than the Planck mass. It provides a good, um, let me um, continue writing. Well, let me just lift this. Um, it provides um, uh, candidates for dark matter. It provides nice extensions of the standard model where particles that we know in nature, fermions, are included. So there is a generalization, the MSSM. And, well, this is just um, some of the motivations. And um, another one, so the last one I was going to mention, is that it provides coupling unification for grand unified theories. So these are some of uh, so these were the original motivations of also why string theorists were wanted to have an n equal to one in d equal to four. There are also reasons um, coming from the top-down approach. So there are also top-down reasons. 
And these reasons are mainly um, related to calculational power. So it's a strong component of the motivation why we would like to have supersymmetry is that uh, in supersymmetric theories, we have got more control of the theory. Namely, calculations of effective actions, minima of potential, and so on, become much easier in supersymmetric theories rather than in non-supersymmetric theories. We can furthermore do extrapolations from, strong to weak, from weak to strong coupling, um, things that people, uh, a fact that has been used many times in the literature to do, for example, calculation of entropy of black holes. And we are interested precisely in n equal to 1, d equal to 4, and not in n equal to 2, for example, in d equal to 4, because n equal to 2 is too strongly constrained. As Nati was saying, so you cannot get supersymmetry breaking in n equal to 2 theories, nor do you have an interesting particle content in the lower dimensional theories. So for this reason, we precisely would like to have n equal to 1. And um, as Katten pointed out, if we would like to have an n equal uh, supersymmetry, so let me focus on theories that have n equal to 1 supersymmetry and d equal to 4. But very generally, if you would like to have a theory that is supersymmetric in lower dimensions, it implies in string theory, or if you compactify a higher dimensional theory, that um, there are covariantly constant spinners. So Susie implies that we need covariantly constant spinners. So spinners whose covariant derivative is equal to zero. And this is strongly related to the holonomy of the internal manifold. So the existence of covariantly constant spinners is strongly related to the holonomy of the manifold. So for those of you who maybe don't remember, so if you take, if you do have a compact manifold and you take spinners and you parallel transport them, so let me draw a picture here. You parallel transport a spinner on a manifold and you take a closed curve. Then, in general, the spinner is not going to be coming back to itself. So, let me paint it this way here. The spinner is not going to come back to itself, but will be rotated. It will be rotated by a matrix U, and this matrix is U form a group which is called the holonomy group. And a lot of effort of string theorists has gone into constructing manifolds that are of special holonomy. So, um, because these theories precisely give you um, supersymmetric theories in lower, dimensional, uh, in lower dimensions. So, we know that, um, so what we know is, so Calabria manifolds, so what people knew um, years ago are Calabria three folds, which are Ritchie flat and killer manifolds. manifolds that do have an SU3 holonomy. But in more recent times, um, string theorists have become interested in M3. So if you would like to compactify M3 to four dimensions, get a theory with n equal to one supersymmetry. So what you need is, um, what you need is um, G2 holonomy manifolds. So are some special. So if you would like to take M3, so let me put it here. M3 to four dimensions requires that you do have G2 holonomy manifolds. So these are not complex manifolds like Calabria manifolds because um, they are seven-dimensional manifolds. Or um, if you would like to take M3 and go to three dimensions, so in three dimensions, if you would like to have an N equal to two in three dimensions, so if you would like to have M3 in three dimensions, and getting an n equal to 2 theory in three dimensions, which has similar properties as n equal to 2 in four dimensions. So, what you can take is a Calabria fourfold, while spin 7 will give you n equal to 1. There are many um, Calabria manifolds. So, if you look at lower dimensional, um, Calabria manifolds, there is only a very, very restricted number of Calabria manifolds. So if you look at manifolds of complex dimension one, so you can have either a torus or you can have the complex plane for a non-compact example. 
If you go to convex dimension two, you can have just two compact examples, the T2 and um, the T2 and K3, T4 and K3, excuse me. You can have T4 and K3. So these are the only compact examples that are known. There are, of course, non-compact examples. But the situation changes dramatically if you go beyond complex dimension two. So there are many thousands of Calabi-Yam manifolds, probably even an infinite number of them. And there are even more manifolds if you take fluxes into account. So fluxes are, are special type of compactifications where tensor fields that exist in string theory are not set to zero by hand. So and this enormous number of string theory um, of solutions of internal manifolds has been called the string theory landscape. And there's currently no selection principle of how we could pick one vacua among the other. So um, some string theorists have gone um, through um, the statistics of the vacua. So finding properties of our real world by making um, statistics of the vacua. And I don't know how my time is going to go, but if I have time, I will walk you through a very, very simple example where the statistical approach um, is shown. Um, so let's see. Um, as I pointed already out, so Calabi-Ya manifolds have got some unrealistic quantities, which are the moduli fields. So if you compactify string theory on an ordinary Calabi-Ya manifold, you get massless scalars in the lower dimensional theory. Those massless scalars then um, don't, first of all, they, we don't have massless scalars in nature. Second of all, these moduli fields appear in the coupling constants of the lower dimensional theory so that we don't have any predictive power. So string theorists have realized that warp compactifications provide a solution, provide a solution to this problem. So there's the moduli space problem. So, and if you turn on the tensor fields, so flux compactifications, where in general you will have tensor fields, so with an arbitrary number of indices depending on the theory, so these tensor fields have non vanishing expectation value, so, so these are called warped compactifications. Or flux compactifications. So and these theories, um, string theories have understood, and we will see this in these two lectures, why um, such compactifications provide a solution to the moduli space problem. So in flex compactifications, as I have mentioned, so there are pure tensor fields. Let me erase this here. So in flex compactifications, we do have tensor fields. And those tensor fields um, can live on brains or we don't have brains point-like objects as sources. So the situation is very similar. So we do have tensor fields and flux compactifications. In order to have these tensor fields, we can have either tensor fields that live on brains, or we don't have brains in the theory, so no brains and just fluxes. So in the case where we do have brains, the situation is very similar as what we know from electro, so from ordinary electromagnetism. So from electromagnetism 101, what we know is, so let's look so at the example where we do have brains. So what we know from ENM 101 is that um, you can write Maxwell's equations as a D of F2 equal to star JM, so magnetic sources. This F2 is the Maxwell tensor. F2 is the Maxwell tensor, which contains the information about the electric and the magnetic field. So we can write this as a D of A1 form potential. And we do have a D of star F2, which is described by the electric sources. So this JE, so this J is the rod, and here are one forms. So these J's are one forms that contain, so J's are one forms, which contain, 
um, the information about the current and the charge. So this JMU, a zero component, the charge, and the other components are the current. So in the case of electromagnetism, what we, if we do have point-like objects, we know, we know that this current is simply the electric charge E multiplied by a delta function. And the electric charge that I wrote down there, we can obtain by applying Gauss's law Oops, let's see. So we can apply Gauss's law um, to obtain the electric and the magnetic charges, something that does have a very, very close analog um, when we apply brains. So Gauss's law then tells us that we can obtain the electric charge that I wrote down there simply by integrating the tensor field, the tensor field over a two sphere. And the same thing for the magnetic for the magnetic charge. For the higher dimensional case, when we describe brains, the situation is very, very similar. What we know is that on the world volume of the brain, we do have tensor fields. So we no longer so for brains are higher dimensional extended objects. And we do have tensor fields, so no longer a two-form field, but in general, it's going to have more indices than that. And we know that the world volume action of a P-brain contains, contains a tensor field where there's a coupling. This coupling mu P is exactly the same thing as the E that I introduced there. It's the electric charge. It's the brain charge. And there are tens of fields that live on the world volume. So if I do have a P brain, a P brain purpose to C P plus one potential. So C P plus one is the potential. And we do have a two form field strength F, which is a P plus two form then, which is a D of C P plus one. Uh, yes. There's in general going to be more, there are in general more terms than that. So we will later on see when I discuss particular the type 2B theory, so you're going to be having more stuff. So there's F and then there's more in there. Yes, that's correct. So, but it's going to be then lower dimensional, it's going to be in general lower dimensional tensor fields. And right now I'm assuming they are not in there, but it's a very good point. So. Oh, I, I understood he said, why would I say this equal to this? Is there something else there? And the answer is, well, you have in general low dimensional objects sitting there, but right now I'm not taking them into account. Was that, did I, that's what? Yeah? Okay. So, um, so now we do have, um, and very, very similarly as, well, let me put it here, here. Um, very similarly as we do have in the case of electromagnetism, we can apply Gauss's law to define, to define the electric charge um, of a D brain, so of a P brain in D plus one dimension, in D dimensions. So D is the number of dimensions. And assume that I do have a P brain in D dimensions, so that's P brain. Then um, we can integrate then um, to go, uh, star fp plus two over a sphere is d minus p minus two in order to get the electric charge. And very similarly, you can go, obtain the magnetic charge. Let me put it here. Um, let me call this d minus p minus four as an integral of fp plus two over sp plus two. So it's very natural, so it's very natural also in string theory to have tensor fields. There's no reason for setting those fields to zero by hand. 
similarly, very, very similarly as in electromagnetism. However, having moduli fields in the theory is not, has not, is not always something very bad. So there are two moduli fields. Um, there are two moduli fields, so it doesn't have to be always a big problem. And people used it, used it to their advantage in the past. Um, used moduli fields in the past in order to do string perturbation theory. So there are two moduli fields. Two fields that, if you don't turn on fluxes, are moduli fields and that, con um, that control the perturbation theory in string theory, which are the radial modulus and the dilaton. So having moduli fields is not necessarily bad. because we can do um, string perturbation theory. So there is the radial modulus. So if you don't turn on fluxes, there is the radial modulus. So let me call this rho. And the radial modulus controls the size of the Calabilla manifold. There is an approximation, which is the supergravity approximation, that assumes that the manifold is very large. So if rho is very large, which you can assume is if it's a modulus, then you can do a supergravity analysis. Then there's a second modulus, which is the dilaton. So the dilaton contr con uh, controls the string perturbation theory. So if you assume that um, the dilaton is small, so you, if the dilaton is not fixed, so you can assume it's very, very small, then um, you can do a classical analysis in which you neglect um, non-perturbative effects. So you, you go to, to leading order, and you neglect non-perturbative effects. So leading order. And you can neglect also perturbative, higher order so in perturbation theory, and non-perturbative effects. So if you not turn on fluxes, if you not turn on fluxes, the situation is more complicated because you need to think twice whether your perturbation theory is valid. However, there are some models in which um, the moduli fields are all fixed, including the radial modulus and the dilaton, and the supergravity approximation is a valid approximation in the case when n, where n is a flux number, becomes very, very large. However, that is a model-dependent statement and one has to check very, very carefully, model by model, whether your approximations are satisfied. Um, there is, we are, yes? So why is the rhythm being positive here in uh, It's a string coupling constant. So it's a string coupling constant, dilaton is a string coupling constant, and then you can neglect all the higher order terms. Yes, it's, it's perturbation theory. So the, the, the dilaton is, a, is the string coupling constant, and the string perturbation theory is built in powers of GS. So dilaton is GS. It's the expectation value of the dilaton. And when you assume that the coupling constant is small, then you can neglect GS to the 27 or whatever. You can just throw it away. Uh, no, it, well, both. You can neglect perturbative order. So higher orders in perturbation theory and non-perturbative effects, both. Uh, why? It's something that appears usually at strong coupling. So non-perturbative effects. It's exponential, so it's an exponential behavior. So, okay. so you can neglect, if, at weak coupling, you can neglect non-perturbative effects. So, um, so now we do have um, um, these moduli fields, and I was saying that it's a model-dependent statement that we always need to check whether our um, approximations are valid. And we're going to, I'm going to discuss tomorrow a particular model, the deformed conifold, where um, we'll see how the fluxes concretely in this model looks, look like, and we're going to see how potentials and uh, moduli stabilization looks like. Um, this model, so the deformed conifold is a very prominent model, so the, that is due to Klevanov and Strassler, and I assume that Igor is going to tell you more about it, so I'm going to be talking about the supergravity side of the story. 
And it's a model that is so interesting, has been cited a lot of, in the literature, because it's the um, gra super gravity dual of a confining gauge theory. And um, confining gauge theories, so in, in all um, models of ADS CFT, usually the supergravity theory, which is dual to an interesting supersymmetric gauge theory, contains tensor fields. So that's another motivation why we'd, we'd like to understand those tensor fields better. And there's, um, there are some more reasons, so let me just point you um, out one more reason why people have been interested in this type of compactifications in the literature, which comes more from the phenomenology community. So people working in the phenomenology community became very excited about um, warped compactifications when they um, realized, so Randall Sundrum realized, so in the context of the so-called brain world scenarios, that you can generate a large hierarchy of scales if you consider a warp factor. So what do I mean with that? So in brain world scenarios, the idea of radio scenarios, at least in one of the um, scenarios Randall syndrome had, the idea was the following. They were giving an alternative to compactification. So this scenario is supposed to be an alternative to compactification. So to Kalitza-Klein compactification. And what they were imagining is that our world is four-dimensional, so we live on a brain that is a four-dimensional brain. And this four-dimensional brain is embedded into a five-dimensional space-time. So let me call the fifth coordinate X, X5. So the question that then arises is how does it come that we haven't uh, observed uh, variations from the one over our square of gravity that we know is valid in four dimensions? So in other words, why is our world, do we see for in our world still a four dimensional gravitational force? And the reason is that there's a warp factor, a warp factor that decreases. So let me call this e to the minus a x5. A warp factor that increases as x5 increases which generates then a large hierarchy of scales. So in this way, they were able to explain why our world is four-dimensional. And such a hierarchy of scales um, can be generated in string theory. We are going to see how in the type 2b theory, um, tomorrow we are going to see how we can generate such a large hierarchy of scales in the type 2b theory. What people would like to use it for is when they would like to look, for example, for supersymmetry at the TV scale, then you can assume that there are phenomena that usually we thought are just valid at Planck scale, and you can bring it down using this warp factor to accessible energies, which is why people found the existence of these warp factors and why they create such a hierarchy, something very interesting. So, and I will see how my timing goes. If I do have um, time to get into it, I will um, give you a little bit of a motivation at the end of tomorrow's lectures of why um, brains and fluxes are interesting for cosmology. And they're mainly interested for cosmology because with them, we can generate models of inflation. So what we know is that um, the standard Big Bang model explains many futures of our universe. It explains the existence of the cosmic microwave background, which fills our universe. However, there are some properties of this background, which are the anisotropic anisotropies, which the standard Big Bang model doesn't explain. And we need a short, uh, a short period of rapid inflation um, in order to explain um, such anisotropies. And, um, so the cosmologists have um, put forward, have presented many models of inflation, but the ultimate model of inflation has to come from string theory. So string theorists are interested in seeing how can we realize inflation, and um, most of the models, that, or all of the models that have been proposed, involve brains and fluxes. 
So let me, um, after this um, motivation, um, start showing you concretely what we would like to do in the context of the type to be theory. Still, it's interesting that we are discussing the type to be theory because um, years ago, people wouldn't even look at the type to be theory because it's not interesting for phenomenology. The reason is that people were looking at Calabi-Yau compactifications of the type to be theory. Calabi-Yau compactifications of type to be give you n equal to two and d equal to four. So people said, well, that's not interesting for phenomenology. However, if you get now into brain physics, then people studying, for example, intersecting brain, world, uh, intersecting brain models know that on the intersection of such brains, you can generate n equal to one theories that are chiral. Some of them resemble very closely the standard model. So let me start um, the concrete discussion about type to be fluxes. So, and what I would like to do first is to make a connection to what Catherine discussed in the context of M3 and fourfolds. So, I recall that Catherine derived um, in the context of M3 and fourfolds, she um, derived some constraints. So, we know that in, in M3 we do have a fourfold flux. And this four-form flux has to satisfy some particular constraints if you would like to have supersymmetry in the three-dimensional theory. So let me remind you on what these constraints are, and let me use these constraints to make a first derivation how the flux constraints in the type 2B theory look like. So let's start with fluxes in type 2B. And um, again, so let me make um, a connection to M3 and 8 manifolds, because what we can do, so let me call this on fourfolds. So what we know is that M3 on fourfolds gives us an n equal to two super n equal to two theory in d equal to three. Those n equal to two theories in d equal to three are very similar, have very similar properties. That, that n equal, have very similar properties than n equal to one theories in d equal to four. Those n equal to one theories in d equal to four, you can get by taking F3 on the same Calabria fourfold. And you can um, impose similar constraints, the same constraints as you do have in M3 to derive the constraints in the type 2B theory. So let me show you what I mean with that. So recall that, so, Catherine showed you how um, the metric, so we would like to have a metric, let's make a metric ansatz for the 11 dimensional metric. That is a warp metric ansatz. So let me call the warp factor, depending on the internal coordinates. So this y are the internal coordinates. Um, let me compactify to Minkowski space in three dimensions. So that's the three-dimensional theory. Let me call this. GMN is the internal metric. So let me call Y the coordinates of the internal theory. And this delta is the warp factor that, because of Poincaré invariance, depends only on the internal coordinates. Similarly, we know, um, we know that Poincaré invariance demands, um, gives us, Poincaré invariance gives us some restrictions on the four form flux. Namely, it tells us that the only non vanishing component of the flux is the one um, with internal indices. So my M and N. Latin indices here are internal indices, while um, the only non-vanishing component that does have external indices has to contain three external indices and one internal index. And this 
three in, uh, external indices have to be proportional to the epsilon tensor in three dimensions. Um, this f is a function that depends only on the internal coordinates and is related to the warp factor in the theory. So what we know is that this internal component of the flux, um, the internal component of the flux, let me put it here. So the internal component of the flux um, satisfies, so if you would like to have supersymmetry to be valid, so we would like to have supersymmetry, so we can look at how the gravitino variation looks like, and if you would like to have supersymmetry, um, we need to set, so the for zero component of the flux and the um, zero four component, the one three component and the three one component have all um, to be equal to zero. Otherwise, if you turn on one of these components, you will break supersymmetry. The only non-vanishing component is the 2-2 component, and this 2-2 component has to be primitive. No, it's gone. Okay. Let me write on a different board because I would like to see my fluxes. Continue here. So the only non-vanishing component has to be um, primitive, and it's the two-two component. So it, which means that it's contraction, or I can write it with a wedge product with the Keller form of the internal geometry has to be equal to zero. So this is primitive. Now, what we can do is um, to use now the constraints that I just wrote down on these two boards um, to derive the constraints on the three form in the type 2b theory. So what I would like to do is to take, um, to take um, a particular type of fourfold, which is interesting for F3, which is a, an elliptically fibered Calabria fourfold, which means I take a fourfold that does have a torus vibration over a six-dimensional base. So let's see how we can use this now, what we just learned in the context of F3. So I'm derived from there the type to be constraints. So I would like to take a Calabriere fourfold that is elliptically fibered, which means I do have a torus that varies over a base. And the torus now, it's going to depend on the coordinates, so it's RT2. Um, that depends on the base. The tau parameter of this torus is precisely related to the type to be axion and dilaton. And these are, um, in principle, non-perturbative aqua because the dilaton can, be, can become very um, large. So what we know is that in the type 2b theory, um, I don't have a four-form. What I do have is a three-form, G3, that has got a Ramon Ramon part, F3, minus tau, um, the dilaton axion, multiplied by the Neville-Schwarz three-form. And I do have a five form that is self-dual. And what I can do is I can take, so F3 has got a four form. I can take the F3 four form and write them in terms, write them in terms of this G's. Mm, let's do it here. I can write down the F4 in terms of Gs, and from the um, constraints that I'm just erasing here, the 4, 0, 0, 4, and 3, 1 equal to 0, I can derive constraints on the G in the type 2B theory. So let's see how that works. So I can write down, so in F3 I do have a 4 form, and the way I can write down this 4 form is um, in the following way, so I would like to have something that is real. 
So I can um, introduce complex coordinates on my torus, and I would like to have something that is real. So in general, I can have something that has got a dz um, minus g3 dz bar. So this satisfies that it's real. Um, this z and z bar are complex coordinates on the torus. So these are t2 coordinates. Or I can write um, this equation here in components. So let me write down this equation in components. So what I see is that the 1, 3 component of this equation is nothing but 1 divided by um, tau minus tau bar. Now I can take the 0, 3 component of the first one. So that precisely gives me, uh, so my notation is that the first index denotes the holomorphic components, the second index the anti-holomorphic components. So um, this gives me a 1, 3 form minus G3. So if I take from the G3 the 1, 2 part and I wedge it with a DZ bar, I get a form with the correct properties. So let me write down. The next component, and what I see, well, what I see already, let me point it out here already. So what I see is that the constraint in M3 that was telling me that F13 has to be equal to zero for supersymmetry implies that this component of the flux, so the one, two component of the flux has to be, so supersymmetry demands that in the type to B theory, the one, two component of the flux has to be equal to zero. And I can see that the um, 3, 0 component of the flux has to be equal to 0. Very similarly, I can write down the other components of the flux um, in terms, well, let me, let me just do it. I can uh, write down the other components of the flux in terms of the Gs and, well, let me leave maybe that part just as an exercise. So write down the other components of the flux um, in terms of the Gs. And what you see is um, you can obtain the constraints from the type 2B theory, namely from setting the, um, let's see. If I set the um, zero 4 component of the flux equal to zero, so zero 4 component of the flux equal to zero, so and again, please check this in detail. What I see is that the zero 3 component of G3 has to be equal to zero. And if I take into account that the 2 2 component of the F3 flux, so the 2 2 component of the F3 flux is, equal, uh, is primitive, what I get from here is that the uh, um, G3, so from supersymmetry, G3 has to be primitive. Well, this J is the killer form of the base. Oh, I forgot to say, so the only non-vanishing component is the 2-1 component. So the only non-vanishing component here is the 2-1 component. So since I've concluded, since I've concluded that the 0-3 component, the 3-0 component, and the 1-2 component are equal to zero, I'm left with only the 2-1 component of G. And so that's the only non-vanishing component that is allowed by supersymmetry. If I now use that um, the 2-2 the four, the four, uh, two, two form of F3 is primitive, what I know is that the 2-1 form in the type 2B theory is primitive. So primitivity, so if in the case when the manifold, so the six-dimensional manifold that I take in, M, in the type 2B theory is a manifold that is simply connected where H10 is equal to zero, then primitivity doesn't um, impose an additional constraint. So in other words, and here comes again a statement that I would like you to check um, in more detail, which is the following. Uh, let me take down here. 
If I do have a simply connected manifold, a simply connected manifold, which on, on which um, H10 is equal to zero, then any harmonic um, to one form on this manifold is primitive. And we do have the proof of that in the book, but I would like you to go through it because it's a good exercise um, which uses the Lefschetz decomposition. So again, the statement is the following. So if I do have a simply connected manifold, so in this case, so I'm talking about the base manifold, so M, so let me call X the base manifold of the fourfold. Um, and if H1 of the, H10 of the base is equal to zero, which is a statement about simply connected manifolds, then the statement is that any harmonic to one form is automatically primitive. So G um, harmonic, so a harmonic form And again, so the proof of the statement, um, so if it's automatically primitive, then this doesn't give you any additional constraint. Again, so the proof uses the Lefschetz decomposition. It's done in the book, and I would like you um, to please check it out in detail. So now what, I, what we concluded is that supersymmetry allows only the to one component, the to one component of the type to be flux. And the analysis we have done is first order equation analysis and from supersymmetry. What I would like to do now is to walk you through the analysis of what is allowed by the type to be equations of motion. Because it might be that some of these components are not, not even allowed by equations of motion. So t let's take a look at the type to be, um, type to be equations of motion and how um, the statements from the type to be theory the Nago theorem of the type to B theory um, was um, derived many years ago. So let's take a look um, at equations of motion. In the type to B theory. And again, so my first um, goal is to derive the Nogo theorem. And the statement of this um, Nogo theorem is that if you use um, compact internal geometry, so there were some assumptions people were making. Number one, so assumptions, so how do we derive this? The assumptions that we need to do in order to derive the Nogo theorem are that we do have compact, compact and non-singular M6. So M6, I mean the internal manifold. I need to assume that I don't have any sources. So there are no brain sources. And I'm making just the leading order supergravity approximation. Take any of these away, and then your Nogo theorem will no longer be valid. Something people have used, so in recent years, um, in order to find more interesting vacua. So if we do have uh, this case scenario, so where we don't have any of these, then the statement is that what compactifications of type B3, um, so what compactifications are trivial, in other words, what um, compactifications to Minkowski space are trivial, In other words, the warp factor um, just disappears. The warp factor and the fluxes just disappear, so become trivial. So fluxes come out to be equal to zero. Fluxes come equal to zero, and the warp factor comes out to be constant. Uh, 
And the sitter is not, only, it's not even allowed as a solution, so the sitter is not allowed. So let's take a look how, how we can derive um, these concrete statements. So before I do that, are there any questions? Yes. Yes, I'll show you how it changes because it's going to be high, an example here in the type 2b theory is that you do have higher terms on the set world volume of the seven brain. And those are going to change the energy momentum tensor that you use as a source in your equations of motion. So if you give me a second, I'll walk you through it. You will see how it works. So um, let's, so let's um, start going through it. So what I, the first thing I need is the um, type to be action, tell you what, um, how the concrete um, type to be action looks like, and what the particular um, field content is. So in the type to be action, what we do have is the following terms. Um, I'm assuming a supergravity approximation, and I'm taking the 10-dimensional Einstein frame, where I just have the scalar curvature. Then I do have um, the kinetic term for the axiodilaton. I'm assuming that the Ramon-Ramon scalar is equal to zero just for simplicity. So this m tau describes the dilaton. is a five-form field strength that is self-dual. So the self-duality constraint I will have to impose by hand. So um, then there's a transformance term. So I need to impose by hand. So this F5 is self-dual. It's a self-dual five-form. And I will impose the self-duality constraint by hand which is not a problem because I'll be dealing with equations of motion anyway. So usually self imposing self-duality constraint by hand is a problem because your action will not be supersymmetric. So your action which doesn't satisfy the self-duality constraint is not supersymmetric, but for us it's not going to be a problem because I'm interested in equations of motion. So from that point of view, it's not so much relevant. So that is um, the form of the action. And what we would like to do, again, is um, to um, make a metric ansatz, a metric ansatz which will contain a warp factor, and um, make an ansatz for the different components, make an ansatz for the different components of the tensor field. So let me do that. And let's think how the equations of motion then get modified. So again, so right now I will not be assuming any sources, but I will point you so there are not going to be any brains in my theory, nor are they going to be, um, the manifolds are going to be compact, but I will point you directly to the um, point where the arguments that I'm going to make that lead to the Nogo theorem are going to be changing. So what I would like to make is an ansatz for the 10-dimensional metric. that contains, again, a warp factor. So my capital letters are going to be describing 10-dimensional indices. And so I would like to um, call the warp factor A, which, again, depends on the internal coordinates only. 
I will be, let me um, put here a flat metric, so a flat four dimensional metric, but I will, so the, the arguments that I'm going to be making are quite general. You will see the moment I need it, I will change um, this eta minute to a metric that is not flat to show you how we can exclude the sitter space. So, and again, so here I do have the internal component of the, so the metric on the internal space. So the warp factor, um, again, so notice the warp factor here, again, because of Poincaré invariance, depends only on the internal coordinates. So for the same reason, for the same reason, um, Poincaré invariance tells us that the G3 is going to have only components in the internal directions. So again, small Latin letters denote my internal directions. And the five-form flux, um, the self-dual five-form, has, is related to the word factor, so that's very similarly as what we had in M3. So where we know that the, um, there is a particular component, the external component of the flux is related to the word factor. So let me write this as one plus um, star D. It's the tandem, so, so the form is self-dual, multiplied by D alpha. So alpha is my word factor, or it's gonna be related to the word factor. And we're going to see again, so the goal is to show that alpha is related to the warp factor. So this is determined then, so this will be determined in the analysis. Okay, so now that we do have um, the form of our action, we do have our metric ansatz, so we can write down how the equations of motion of this theory look like. Uh, what we get, um, so what we get is simply um, the Einstein equation, the Einstein equation which has then contributions, contributions from the individual flux factors which appear in the energy momentum tensor of the theory. So what do we know? So we know um, that the equation of motion that follows from this theory is Einstein's equation. Einstein's equation containing the energy momentum tensor. So we know that the equation of motion is simply Einstein's equation. And it contains an energy momentum tensor. And now we need to discuss which energy momentum tensor we put into this. So TLL is the trace of the energy momentum tensor. So the energy momentum tensor, which you simply get by varying the action with respect to the metric. Now, now comes the important point that if we do not have any brain sources, if you don't have any brain sources, so the energy momentum tensor that we are going to be putting in this equation is the energy momentum tensor for coming from the action that I wrote down over there. So which I will call T, um, so, so if you don't have any sources, T will be the T of the supergravity theory, um, which I obtained from, from the above action there. If I include sources in my theory, at that moment I need to take those sources into account and vary my action, so vary the action for the sources with respect to the metric, and this will give me additional contributions to the Einstein equation, to the right-hand side of the Einstein equation, and it will change my conclusions. So let's see how um, this works in detail. So what we need to do when we see that, so we need to plug into the Einstein equations that are out right under the energy momentum tensor coming from the ten so the energy momentum tensor coming from the tensor fields. So we need to evaluate this energy momentum tensor. Again, so that's a small exercise that I'm gonna leave for you guys to do. 
um, work out how, so the question is work out the energy momentum tensor from the flexes, and I tell you what comes out of there. It's really a very simple calculation, but it's good to check it. And once we do that, We get the following. So, um, from so let me write down the external component. So let's take a look. So I have Einstein's equation, and let me take a look at the external component of Einstein, which means I would like to look at the component R with indices on the external space, four-dimensional external space. And let me write this equation in the following way. Let me put still capital letters because. Um, capital letters means that I'm measuring the curvature. So recall that I do have my metric as a warped metric here. What I would like to do is to measure, so the equation that I'm writing down here measures curvatures with respect to the big metric here. And I'm going to transform in a moment to, um, to, a, to a curvature which measures uh, to an Ricci tensor which measures, which is measures with respect to this eta mu nu or g mu nu in general. So let me first put here capital letters, which is the curvature coming from the metric, the big metric that I wrote on there, and transform in a second. So this is the part that comes from the energy momentum tensor for the sources, for the, for the fluxes, sorry. Not the sources, the fluxes. And again, so check um, that you agree with this. And if I would like now to transform with res to curvatures with respect to the metric eta mu nu, or let me leave it, uh, let me put now a metric g mu nu in there, so then I know how um, the curvatures, so there's a standard formula, how the curvatures transform from one to the other. And what we get from there, so let me show you how this formula looks like. Again, it's something that you can um, sit down and check. So curvatures with respect to the measured with respect to the metric big G are related to the curvatures measured with respect to the metric G mu, um, eta mu nu, well, let me put G mu nu here for now. So are related by a warp factor. So now last square plus R mu nu G mu nu. So, and again, so if you're, I'm considering Minkowski space, so the last term will vanish. It's going to be relevant in a moment when I um, talk about the Sitter space. So, anyway, once I do have um, this and I insert it in the above equation, uh, what I get is, so again, so for Minkowski, this contribution vanishes, and I get um, an equation for the warp factor. An equation for the warp factor, which takes the following form. Um, nabla, so box. Um, a is e to the 4i divided by 8 times the imaginary part of tau g3 square. And what you see is on the right hand side here of this equation, um, already um, only expressions that are positive, so the squares appear here, expressions that are positive. So on the right-hand side of this equation, we see that everything is square, everything is positive. And um, what I see is on the left-hand side of this equation, I get a box A. So if I integrate this equation over an internal, over the compact, so here comes the point where it's relevant that I do have a compact internal six-dimensional manifold, then we know um, that 
the left hand side of this equation vanishes. For the right hand side to vanish, what I need is that each one of these terms vanishes. So each one of these terms vanishes. Um, it means that I do have the fluxes. So fluxes come out to be equal to zero, and warp factors come out to be constant. So alpha is equal to, well, alpha is constant. Alpha and A come out to be constants. So that's the famous Nogo theorem. Nogo theorem that um, was in the literature um, for many, many years. So the situation um, doesn't get any better if you, um, if you take, um, instead of taking Minkowski space, you would like to take the sitter space. So what you get is then an additional contribution to the right-hand side of this equation. So because I get contrib a contribution from this term here, which is no longer equal to zero, and that contribution is a, is a factor, let me write it down here. Again, a factor, well, related to the scalar curvature, which will not allow me to get the sitter space. So e to the minus 4a divided by 4 multiplied by the scalar, the Ricci scalar of the metric g mu nu. In other words, if you take, put in there the sitter space, which is positive, so the sitter space is also excluded. So only thing that would be allowed is then um, well, either Minkowski space, but with all warp factors out of the theory, ordinary compactification to Minkowski space, or a compactification to anti serial space. Yes? Uh, what, what if you consider the sitter? What do I say with the sitter? Well, you can consider the sitter too, no? Because the, the metric won't change. It's a maximum no, no, but if I take a space, uh, again, as I said, if this R, the moment this R is positive, then you're in trouble. The sitter has got the R positive, so nothing, you cannot do it. Any more questions? But if you take anti sitter, you're perfectly fine. People knew that. So, and there, there are compactifications to anti sitter with fluxes, freud rubin compactifications that people knew for many, many years. So, that's nothing, nothing out of the world. More questions? Okay, so um, that is um, the famous Nogal theorem. So where does the Nogal theorem change? Well, I said it already before, um, put uh, in the energy momentum tensor appearing on the right-hand side right now. If you look at this energy momentum tensor route right down there, I didn't write any contributions coming from sources. So the moment I take now brains into account, then um, the whole argument here is going to be changing because once I do have brains, then I can um, tell you in which situations on the right-hand side I can generate negative terms that come from the sources. And then the Nogo theorem is no longer valid. Those negative terms will come from three brains or from seven brains wrapped up around four cycles. So in general, what you can consider is either three brains filling out the external space-time or all possible type of brains that are wrapped around an internal cycle and they fill out the external space time. So let me do, do this um, more slowly so I do have still a little bit of time. So um, the equation of motion, so let me write down again the equation, um, well, let me write it down one more time so in a little bit different way because that is what, I, what I'm going to need um, so I'm writing down now exactly the same equation I had before, just transforming it a little bit. So the equation for the warp factor gets then an additional contribution. So let me put here So the contribution from the local sources, so let me put it um, the following way to kappa prime t, and let me put here log from the local sources. This is the trace of the energy momentum tensor of the local sources, so it's, so or let me put it as tmm for the local sources, for the sources. Um, 
um, which we then need to evaluate. And again, so let me write it down. So, in, so what we can have is contributions again from Poincaré invariants. So we, can, we would like to have a brain. We would like to have brains serving as sources. Poincaré invariants um, demands that those sources. Um, so there's no point singled out in the external space time. I would like to have those brains sitting, filling out the external space time and wrapping supersymmetric cycles. So what we do have is DP brains, so our sources can be DP brains. Um, sources are going to be DP brains. Um, filling out the external space time and wrapping a P minus, so wrapping a P minus three cycle. So what I have is, if you look at this formula, so particular types of sources that are allowed are three brains. Those three brains are going to be filling out the external space time. I can have seven brains. Those seven brains are going to be wrapping supersymmetric four cycles. And how does the contribution um, of those DP brains look like? Well, we can now evaluate the contribution from the energy momentum tensor of these um, sources. Because we know exactly how the world volume action of a DP brain looks like. So what we know is, so let's take a look at how the world volume action of a DP brain looks like. So we know, um, so we know that there's a DBI action describing the world volume of D brains. And I would like to take this D brain um, filling out the external space time. So let me put on R4 as external space time multiplied by a supersymmetric cycle P minus three cycle. And what I know is that in general, so if I do have a P brain, I do have P brains have a P plus one dimensional world volume. This TP is the tension of the brain. Then I do have a Chern Simons term, so the one I discussed at the beginning that, does, that is coupled to the brain charge. And I do have the C plus one tensor field, uh, C plus one tensor field living on the brain world volume. So that's the DBI action for a P brain, a, a DP brain. So once I do have how the world volume action of this DP brain looks like, I can evaluate the energy momentum tensor. Again, so simple exercise that you can do during Natty's lecture tomorrow. <laughs> And um, so you can work out how this energy momentum tensor looks like. And GKP have done this. Um, the energy moment, let me just tell you what comes out of it. And we're going to be using it. So T, um, the trace of the energy momentum tensor is equal to um, 7 minus P, 7 minus P, TP, the tension of the brain multiplied by a delta function. So that is the contribution I get um, on the right hand side. Oh, I need my equation. I wanted to let me see whether I can push this up. Yes, so um, there I have got my equation on the right hand side. What I would like to have is on the right hand side of this equation here, I would like to have a contribution that is negative. I just told you what the T log looks like, so the trace. So what I see from here is that if this P, if this P turns out to be less than seven, so for P less than seven, I need brains that do have negative tension because the right hand side of this expression would be positive otherwise. So, and so for P less than seven, so for P less than seven, I need TP to be less than zero. And um, it's well known that in string theory we do have um, objects that do have negative tension. These are the orientifold planes. So we do have orientifold planes and in F3 compactification, so orientifolds have precisely this property. So you can take orientifold three planes, folds, um, which will do for, for you the job. 
Um, so that's the case when this p is less than seven. What I see is that when p is seven, it seems as if we are in trouble. So it seems that seven brains wouldn't do the job of helping us to um, evade the Nogo theorem, yet it's known that in that case it's possible for F3 compactifications. So the question is what's going on here? So if we set this p equal to seven, the right-hand side vanishes. It vanishes, but only if I take the leading order into account, and here it comes to the question, how can corrections help us? So um, to leading order, the contribution from seven brains wrapped around four cycles vanishes, but Seven brains have corrections on their world volume, higher order corrections and curvatures living on their world volume, and those higher order corrections turn out to have precisely the right negative sign um, so that the Nogo theorem can be evaded. So let me show you how those corrections look like. So for seven brains, there is a correction to the Chen Simons term, so D7 brains. So let's put a check here because D7 brains will do the job, but they will do the job if you take higher order corrections to the Chen Simons term into account. Those higher order corrections look in the following way. Again, so it's a D7 brain filling out the R4 and wrapping a four cycle. And those higher order corrections are of the following form. So there are trace of R squared terms. So let me write down, well, let me put here a P1 of R, the first point tracking class, divided by 48. This first point tracking class, as you know, is simply um, trace, so up to factors. So let me skip the factors of 2 pi. It's a trace of R squared where the R the wrote down there is the curvature 2, 4 sign, negative contribution on the right-hand side, so that the Nogo theorem can be evaded. OK, um, so um, in principle, my time is over. But if it's OK, can I take a couple of minutes more? OK, a couple of minutes more. So let me. Um, so let me try um, to go at least through one more argument, which is um, to see how the background, how the background in um, the type two B theory, type two B theory, um, is constrained by the equations of motion. So um, what we, so what we have, um, the ingredients that I um, discussed now that we have so far, are enough to tell us how the constraints on the background look like. And let me um, call the equation, so let me call this above equation, well, um, let me call this equation one. Well, let me leave the blackboard there. So what I know is um, the following. Well, let me better not get into this. Let me just talk about the Bianca identity. Okay, so um, let me derive the constraints then tomorrow, but uh, let me um, point one more thing out, which is the Bianca identity which gives us the tadpole condition in type 2b. So what do we know? So we know that the five form field strength satisfies an equation of motion. Since the five form field strength is self-dual, um, it gives us the five form Bianchi identity, which tells us that d of f5 is h3, which f3. Plus contributions coming from uh, the charges of the sources. So these are the charges, charge density. And what we can do is to take this equation again and integrate this equation over the internal manifold to call uh, to get what is called the tadpole cancellation condition that Catherine also had in the M theory context. And in the type 2B theory, um, this tadpole cancellation condition then um, looks in the following way. <laughs> it's 
So if I integrate both sides of the equation, so what I get is, so as I as one can see from above there, I get my Tatbarans condition condition, which relates the fluxes to um, the charges of the local sources. So these are the charges of the sources. And this is called the tadpole cancellation condition. And what I, what I see from this equation is a couple of things. So what I see is that if I do have sources which contribute to this equation, it doesn't even make sense to set the tens of fields equal to zero by hand because your, your tadpole cancellation condition will be violated. So which means that for the consistency of your theory, you have to take tens of fields into account. What we are going to see, I guess, tomorrow is that this, um, the left hand side, well, this expression that I do have here is actually an expression that is positive because, so this here is bigger than zero, because as we are going to see tomorrow, that um, the three form G3 that I had, which is formulated in terms of the F3 and the H3, so we are going to see tomorrow that the equations of motion require this three form to be self-dual. So it's an analysis that I will do tomorrow. G3 needs to be self-dual, which means um, which in two steps you can show that this part here is positive, which means that the charges need to give a negative contribution to this expression. And you can actually show that seven brains do the correct job. So, and we do have this as an, one of the exercises in the book. Um, it's problem um, 10.12. So problem 10.12, um, again, it's something that you may want to check. So problem 10.12 shows that if you take the seven brains wrapped on four cycles, you exactly get the right sign for the charge so that the tadpole cancellation condition is obeyed. So let me stop, um, ask for questions first, um, and then continue tomorrow. So are there any questions? Do, do you need an I there? Do I need an I? I thought it's dimension or it's self-dual. Uh, no, it's self-dual. In my conventions, it's self-dual. It depends now on the conventions, but in the conventions of GKP, it's self-dual. More questions? Okay, so I don't see any more questions. So then let me stop here and continue tomorrow this discussion and go for KKLT.